Good morning, saints of God. It's my privilege to be with you today. As we know, uh, the month of February is dedicated as Black History Month. <clears throat> and so I have shaped the message around the celebrations of this month. And I have captioned the message for today, how are we doing now? How are we doing now? Our scripture reading, as you heard, comes from Matthew 19, 13 through 15. <clears throat> I believe the purpose of Black History Month is not to ascribe guilt, not to use the pulpit to preach about past wrongs. I think the purpose is partially to reflect on where we have been as a people how far we've come and where we are today and where we're going. I think it's also important. And I think it's especially important for young people to know and understand that we celebrate black history because they stand on the shoulders and backs of countless brave people who have sacrificed their lives for them. And finally, and most importantly, I think Black History Month <clears throat> has significance for the church. As a religious organization, how are we doing? How are we responding to the needs of the downtrodden and the, and the outcast? What is our mission? I hope as I speak with you today that you will tune in and maybe, just maybe, Something will be said that will resonate with you and motivate you to higher heights. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we've come here today to give you praise, honor, and glory. And this month as we celebrate black history, as we contemplate our past, Help us to focus on the present and the future and allow you to lead and direct in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with our history. Just in case some of us may have forgotten. As you all know, We were snatched from West Africa and we were transported to the Western world. Our four parents were sold as slaves on the auction block and then Many of them had to toil 16 or sometimes 20 hours in the fields picking cottons and laboring on the intense heat. This country, as we know, was built on the backs of slavery. 
And then sometime in the 1860s came emancipation. But was it really emancipation? Back then, many of our four parents had to agitate and advocate for basic human rights. And now, we're doing the exact same thing. In fact, there is a, a piece of history that is hidden that I want to share with you. Many of you know about Wall Street, but how many of you know about Black Wall Street? Take a look. The Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is the center of African-American life for the more than 11,000 black residents of the city. Within this community lie 108 black-owned businesses, two theaters, two black schools, and 15 doctor's offices. In fact, Greenwood is nationally recognized. Booker T. Washington, who came through here en route to Muskogee, when he saw uh, the glitter and glamour and the bustling businesses, he declared Greenwood as a Negro Wall Street of America. And since the Civil Rights Movement, we had updated it to the Black Wall Street of America. Barred from shopping and socializing elsewhere in Tulsa, blacks build a place of their own. Greenwood. We had everything out on Greenwood and the, and the Negro area that you needed that were drug, sto had drug stores, grocery stores, cleaners, hotels. All of that, of course, was destroyed when the riot came. On May 31st, 1921, in what has been described as the worst race riot in American history, Greenwood is destroyed. In less than 24 hours, a white mob reduces Black Wall Street to 36 square blocks of smoldering rubble. Scores of African Americans are killed and thousands are left homeless. White Tulsans not only invaded Black Tulsa, they not only looted homes and businesses, they burned it to the ground. The entire black community, aside from a few outlying areas, was absolutely put to the torch. The devastation of this community means much more than the destruction of its buildings. The residents, the men, women, and children who struggled to create this haven will be forever scarred. And so coming out of these experiences, songs were developed to reflect on what transpired and one song that has resonated with me is the song plenty good room and i can't sing so i'm going to have to read the words for you coming out of those experiences song says i've got a long white robe up in heaven i know a long white robe up in heaven i know a long white robe up in heaven I know, choose your seat and sit down. I've got a starry crown up in heaven. I know a starry crown up in heaven. I know a starry crown up in heaven. I know, choose your seat and sit down. These are the songs that our four parents sang to buoy their spirits up. I would not be a sinner. And then the others would respond, be a sinner. I'll tell you the reason why, and the refrain came back. I'm going to tell you the reason why. I'm afraid the Lord might call me, and I wouldn't be ready to die. Other songs like Swing Low, Sweet Chariots, Coming For To Carry Me Home, 
or soon I'll be done with the troubles of the world. These songs came from tears, blood in incredible hardship, which brings us to where we are today. My topic is, how are we doing now? Not only have some of us done well, a number of you have obtained what I call upward mobility. We've come a long way from those days. Some of us have three and four and five bedroom houses, uh, en suite uh, uh, bedrooms, three car garages. We have come a long way. How are we doing now? However, we still struggle with racial injustice. Recently, we witnessed atrocities committed against Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, just to name a few. Our nation has historically welcomed the immigrant. However, we still live in a nation where we struggle with racial profiling and bigoted immigration practices. In our spirit and history, we are an inclusive nation. But in our fears and anxiety, we struggle with the presence of others who look different. Recent riot and talks of Terrible people taking over have polarized our nation. But before you judge the politicians and the judicial system, permit me to remind you that Jesus struggled with some of these same challenges in the church. So let's do the same chronology with the church. How have we done in the past? And how are we doing today? The Bible is replete with instances where Jesus had to deal with these same issues. Jesus encountered the poor, the outcast, the possessed, the lame, and the social stigmas, physical conditions, and cultural realities back then served as signs of exclusion, just as it is today. For instance, the Samaritans were known as dogs. Sounds familiar? The publicans were known as sinners. The Gentiles were seen as outcasts. Women were not allowed in the temple or at least certain parts of the temple. Even children were despised. Our message today focuses on how the church, the disciples of Jesus, a.k.a. the leaders, treated little, defenseless, innocent children. And maybe we can draw some parallel to how we are doing today. Here is our scriptural launching pad, Matthew 19. 13 to 15, Matthew 19, 13 through 15. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them Jesus said, 
let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. I like Mark's version. He puts it in a slightly different manner, but it appeals to me. The New International Version. Mark 10, 13 through 15. This is how he phrases it. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuke them. When Jesus saw this, <laughs> Mark says that he was indignant. He was angry. He, Jesus, he was ticked off. He was hopping mad. Righteous indignation. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. Follow me closely here. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Let me paint this picture for you. Jesus was in the middle of teaching about important church doctrine like marriage and divorce. Follow me carefully here. Jesus had just finished healing people with all forms of illnesses. He was engaged in very serious work. <laughs> and for whatever reason, people began to bring little children for Jesus to put his hands on them and bless them. Now, I'm not sure whose idea <laughs> this was, but the disciples were really ticked off. Matthew said <laughs> they were so angry that they said they rebuked them. And the word rebuked, this is the same word. Remember when, when, when Jesus was on the lake and the storm arose and the disciples were with him and he rebuked the storm. The Greek word there for rebuked translated into English is hush, or a word that we shouldn't say, shut up. That's what Jesus said to the storm. Well, that's the same word that the disciples are using here when they saw people bringing little children to Jesus <laughs> to bless them. Isn't this amazing? The world brought a need in the form of little children, innocent, defenseless children, to the church. And the leaders of the church said, Hush! Get them out of here. These disciples, the leaders, who embodied the preaching and teaching of the gospel were quite comfortable rejecting the defenseless one 
because they were preoccupied with discussing doctrinal truths. Think about that for a minute. The religious right leaders, the conservative ones, the upholders of the law, the ones who were closest to Christ, the ones who were just having discussions on abortion and divorce and probably homosexuality, when, when faced with executing a basic act of kindness, rejected the recipients. Isn't this crazy? Well, what about us today? How are we doing in our treatment of the defenseless? Let me remind you in case you have forgotten, you have seen images of not so long ago of women and children locked in cages. You have seen the execution of a black man on the street. You have seen those images. And by the way, a number of those luminary figures who orchestrated and participated in those heinous crimes are quote-unquote decent religious people. Those are the same people who oppose abortion. Those are decent God-fearing people, religious rights people. And for those of us who say, well, I was not involved in that. Well, let me say this. If we looked the other way and said nothing, then we are just as culpable. And if as a church we did not make our voices known, we are just as as responsible. But let me be a little more specific and bring this home. How are we doing as a church in our treatment of the defenseless? My topic is how are we doing now? Like the disciples of Jesus, how are we treating the innocent, our backslidden members? How do we treat other religions? How we do, do we treat those with a different sexual orientation? What I am seeing is that we can't embrace noble principles and stomp on the necks of the defenseless. The two cannot coincide. We can't embrace noble principles and mercilessly assassinate the defenseless. This is what the disciples were doing when they said, hush or get them out of here. We don't get to choose who comes to Jesus. We don't get to choose who are in need. Jesus calls whomever he chooses. Whenever he chooses, we don't know people's position. We don't know people's situation. It's not our prerogative to try to silence people, even if they seem defenseless. Dr. King Jr. said it best when he said, we should not ask what will happen to us if we help them. Rather, we should ask 
what will happen to them if we don't help them. Permit me to remind you, Church of God, that our role as God's children is not to exclude people from God's provision and ill-treat them. I believe there is plenty good room in our church for Adventist. There is room in our church for Baptists. There is room in our church for Catholics. There is room in our church for Muslims. There is room in our church for Jehovah's Witnesses. I believe there's plenty of good room for anyone who wants a touch from the Master's hands. We should not be in the position to silence or to hush people. That is not our role. More importantly, we should not try to exclude the disadvantaged, the single parent, the substance abuser, the LBGT, the queer. We don't know how to deal with these people, so we bury our heads in the sand sometimes and try to silence them. Our slave for parents understood God to be a creator of the living hope. Jesus promises acceptance. Jesus' promise is that there is plenty good room. God chooses you. God chooses me. Despite our imperfection, God chooses you and me despite our failures. God chooses you and me despite our past, despite our present, God chooses us. Despite where we've been, he chooses us and he makes it clear that there's plenty good room. Jesus has the capacity to embrace even those who have rejected him. His ministry gives us comfort that we can approach. And if we can approach, who are we to try to hush people up like the disciples? You know, I'm so glad that you don't get to play God, and I am so glad <laughs> that I don't get to play God, because if you and I were God, I'm pretty sure we will limit <laughs> the number of those who could get salvation. Some of us will only have a heaven that includes people who look just like us and exclude those who are not like us. I repeat, it is good that you or I are not God because we would limit the inclusion of certain people. We will be like the man who, <laughs> who walked out of church with his wife following the service saying this about the sermon. He wants me to love my enemies. I have trouble even liking my friends. Deep in the back of our minds, many of us will say to ourselves, I know how I made it. But how could she or how could he? The lyrics of the song haunts us. There is plenty good room in my father's kingdom. Our topic is how are we doing today? 
I'm using the backdrop of Jesus and his disciples and their treatment of defenseless children. And I'm making parallels with how today we treat others. Here's another observation I made about this scripture that I found pretty interesting. Some of us think God's blessing, some of, sorry, some of us think God blessing others somehow subtracts from his ability to bless us. Let me say that again. Some of us think that God blessing others subtracts somehow from his ability to bless us. <clears throat> because Jesus was blessing the adults, healing and satisfying their needs didn't mean he didn't have enough time or blessings for the children. Let me remind you that God's reign falls on the just and the unjust. Some of us think and some of us seriously think that God has only limited blessings in his account. So somehow, if he blesses me, he's going to be out of blessings for others. It's sort of like, like, the, uh, like the vaccine distribution. You know, we hear stories of, this, of certain states running out and some people are just fighting to get in front of, of the line because they're afraid that if others get the vaccine, there wouldn't be enough for them. And this is, this is the same mentality that the disciples had because God was involved in teaching and preaching and blessing the adults Somehow, he couldn't have any time for the defenseless. Our kids play that same game with us. So Brittany, when she was small, she would ask me, Dad, who's your favorite? <laughs> and I would say, you are my favorite daughter. And then... Jordan will ask that who is your favorite? And I will say, you are my favorite son. And then Kevin, who wanted to get in on the action, would ask, who is your favorite? And I would say, you are my favorite other son. What is the point I'm trying to make? The point I'm trying to make here is that there is enough blessings in God's account to go around. God blessing you does not subtract from God's ability to bless me. Let me use another example to really drive this point home. When I heard about the, the um, COVID-19 vaccine, I wanted to be one of the recipients because I work with vulnerable people. In addition to that, I'm pretty paranoid, so I might as well get that out of the way, right? <laughs> so when I got the vaccine, I realized that I should not be satisfied with just getting the vaccine but I should explore ways of making it available to others. And so I reached out to a pharmacist who was then able to open doors so that others could receive this vaccine. His opening the doors for others did not subtract from the fact that it was also available to me and him in others, and 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 this is the this is this is the lesson that Jesus was trying to impart 
to the disciples. Jesus blessing the adults should not and was not the only focus. The church taking care of its members should not be the only focus. John Donne, the poet, said it best when he said, No man is an island. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. Jesus blessing us does not subtract from his ability to bless others. Likewise, the gospel challenges you and it challenges me to move outside our historical and cultural identity and embrace God's call to inclusiveness. Inviting people in does not take away from who we are and what we have. Our challenge as a church is to reach out without prejudice and include those who are less fortunate. The challenge is for you and me if only we're willing to meet it. If you are willing and if I am willing, we can embrace the shunned. We can embrace the sub-abuser. We can embrace the wife abuser. We can embrace the estranged person. If we are willing, we can embrace the person who is different from us. And nothing will be subtracted as we embrace them. We've got to learn to move outside of our comfort zone. In order to have compassion towards someone else, you and I must understand God's compassion for us. We are called to live with passion and, and strong enthusiasm for the fulfillment of our lives and the hope that all of God's people experience this power for living. Jesus enters our lives with an eye towards salvation. Our faith should move you and me to do the same. Here is my final observation, and that is Jesus' statement to the disciples. Follow me closely. He said when he saw what the disciples were doing and how they were treating innocent, defenseless children, Jesus said these words, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Think about those words for a minute. Think about the theology behind those words. And then let me ask you this. How are we doing today with this theology that Jesus was espousing here? Have you ever seriously thought about these words of Jesus when he said, suffer the little children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. What are some adjectives used to describe children? Small, innocent, dependent, naive, unlearned, bruised, 
hard, vulnerable. Hear me carefully. Jesus is saying here that his kingdom is going to be comprised of innocent, naive, vulnerable people. Heaven is going to be a place of surprise. A lot of defenseless, trusting, undeserving people just like these little children. You know, when, when I was a child, I was taught that <laughs> only Adventists will be in heaven. And this was fueled by our theology, only the perfect, only people with stars in their crown. Some of our books even had pictures with people of a certain color as the only participants in heaven. As I grew older, I was taught that only uh, uh, vegetarian Adventists will be in heaven, no meat eaters. However, when I read these verses, Jesus tells me, just like he told his disciples back then, that there is plenty good room for undeserving people. In fact, the guy who recorded this story should know he was one of those undeserving people. He was a thief, a rascal, a nefarious crook. But after he met Jesus, his life was totally transformed. And if you read Matthew, you will see that his gospel is filled with this concept, with this Theology that Jesus preached on that day when he said, Suffer the little children. Don't stop them. Don't silence them. Let them come to me. It's not our prerogative to put up barriers to people who are coming to Jesus. Heaven will be comprised of all kinds of people black folk and white folk and brown folk and in between and anyone who comes willingly to Jesus. When you have experienced the passion and an enthusiastic acceptance of Jesus, you want to pass it on to someone. You do not want to be a stumbling block. Let me ask you the question again. How are we doing today? How are we treating the defenseless, the vulnerable, the naive, those who don't have a chance without our help? As we preach about noble principles, how are we treating our fellow human beings? I hope we have gleaned some lessons from the message today and from Jesus' words to his disciples. Let us pray. Our Father, our God, we thank you for the time that we have spent here today. And as we celebrate the highlights of blacks in this country and around the world, may we never forget the sacrifice that you made for us. Bless us as we continue to worship you and praise your name. We glorify you. We honor you. Let the church say, Amen. God bless you.